Cobalt. 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 It's an essential component of batteries in electric cars. Children are working in atrocious conditions. Electric cars are the future. Whether you like it or not, automakers and governments alike are pushing for the mass adoption of EVs over the next decade. But while electric vehicles may be better on carbon emissions than gas cars, making the batteries that power these cars apparently might be doing more damage than we ever thought. It turns out EVs aren't exactly zero emissions, and the parts that go into your clean and green EV might actually be made by exploited workers and child labor. So let's dig into the history of the electric car and take a deep dive into the real impact of an EV, all the way from its actual carbon emissions to the illicit battery mining business that is destroying African nations. I'm Guff, this is Albon, let's get started. Tesla, Rivian, Remats, Lucid, these are all the names that currently dominate automotive news. The one thing they have in common, they're all cutting edge electric car makers. But EVs weren't always the superstars of the car world. In fact, EVs didn't really go mainstream until 2012, when the Tesla Model S was introduced and showed the world that electric cars weren't just dinky little city cars that would run out of charge by the time you left your neighborhood. But before the Model S, practical EVs were basically non-existent. That is, unless you go way, way back in time. The earliest electric cars were actually made in the mid to late 1800s, and they were actually pretty promising. After French physicist Gaston Plante invented the lead acid battery, electric cars started popping up everywhere. They were quiet, easy to drive, and didn't produce all of the harmful pollutants that gas cars and steam cars did at the time. By the early 1900s, London was using electric taxi cabs, and in the US, nearly 40% of all cars on the road were powered by electricity. It really seemed like electric vehicles were the way of the future. And soon, cities around the world wouldn't have to bear the smell and smog of gas burning cars. But then, we started to build more roads. Roads that connected cities that were hundreds or thousands of miles away. And you know what an electric car couldn't do? Travel hundreds or thousands of miles. And so people started to ditch their electric cars in favor for gas power. Because they wanted to do things like road trip across the US or drive from London to Liverpool. Add to that the fact that fuel prices started to plummet. Thanks to many places around the world like Saudi Arabia finding massive petroleum deposits right under their feet. All this meant that driving a gas-powered car was now more practical and easier on the wallet than an electric one. And so, by the 1950s, electric cars basically went extinct. That is, until the 1970s, when the oil crisis caused a massive spike in fuel prices across the board. This forced car manufacturers to start looking into alternative energy solutions. Concepts came out like the GM Impact or the Sinclair C5 and, of course, the Electrovet. But sadly, it really amounted to nothing. The trade-offs for an electric car were still far too high, and the technology hadn't caught up to make it a real practical alternative. But then, in 1985, a discovery was made that changed everything. Again, Akira Yoshino, a Japanese chemist, created the first working prototype of the lithium-ion battery. These batteries used lithium suspended in an electrolyte that traveled between a positive and negative electrode. These electrodes were often made of exotic materials like nickel, manganese, and cobalt, which were all very difficult to mine and extremely expensive. Remember that for later. Regardless of cost though, it was still a massive step forward. Lithium ion had over three times the energy density of the old lead acid batteries that had been in use since the late 1800s. And so car manufacturers saw a real opportunity here. By the mid 90s, companies like Toyota and Honda went to work creating hybrid electric vehicles, which used both a lithium ion battery and a small gas engine. The idea was to have a clean form of propulsion powered by electricity, but without all of the range trade-offs thanks to the gas engine. And these little hybrids were actually pretty astounding the Toyota Prius achieved nearly 50 miles per gallon in testing, and it produced about half of the carbon emissions of a normal vehicle at the time. The Honda Insight came two years later to capitalize on that exact same market, and by the early 2000s, there were hybrids everywhere. But despite this new push for electrification, nobody was making a fully electric car. It seemed that even with the advancements in lithium ion battery technology, it still wasn't far enough along to create a fully fledged electric vehicle that could do all the things a gas powered vehicle could. That is, until a little California startup called Tesla came along. 
In 2004, Tesla started work on an all new electric sports car called the Tesla Roadster. This was a fully battery electric sports car that was based off of a modified Lotus Elise platform and fitted with a 250 horsepower electric motor paired with a 53 kilowatt hour battery. This was a massive leap in battery size compared to anything else on the market, with the Prius having just a 1.3 kilowatt hour battery. With that big old battery, the Roadster could do about 200 miles on a single charge which was unprecedented for an electric car at the time. And it could hit 60 miles per hour in just 3.9 seconds, all while emitting zero carbon emissions. This was proof positive that there was a real space for an electric car in the modern era. And it wouldn't be long before everyone else saw that and would jump on board. In 2009, Mitsubishi started selling the iMy EV, which was kind of awful. But in 2010, Nissan started selling the Nissan Leaf. And this was a real breakthrough in in bringing electric cars to the mass market. The Tesla Roadster cost over $100,000 new, but the Leaf, well, it cost 33 grand. And with the federal tax credit in the US, it was only about $25,000 to buy one. Sure, it was pretty limited with a 100 mile range, but it was a solid foundation for an affordable city EV that Nissan could continue to build upon over the next few years. In 2012, Tesla stopped selling the Roadster and introduced the car they had always wanted to make, the Tesla Model S. This was a luxury sedan that came equipped with a next-gen 60 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery, one that Elon Musk claimed had twice the energy density of the Nissan Leaf's battery. This resulted in over 200 miles in the base trim and over 260 miles with the extended range 85 kilowatt hour battery pack. This was finally it, a practical and usable electric car. One that was not only as usable as a gas car, but quieter, more advanced, and faster to boot, all while not actively polluting the atmosphere. Now, of course, these cars didn't work for everyone. They were pretty expensive and the range wasn't good enough for a lot of people. And of course, the early cars had some reliability concerns, but people still bought them. They were that impressive. And over the years, Tesla continued to improve and iterate on that design with better batteries and motors, as well as new models like the X and the three and the Y and so on. Chevy joined the EV fray in 2015 with the Chevy Bolt and Hyundai followed suit in 2016. And by the time you get to now, 2021, nearly every major manufacturer has invested in a significant EV project with many of them spending more on their electric car divisions than any other category. So it seems like we've finally turned a corner and gone full circle back to the late 1800s. EVs are soon going to dominate the market, especially considering that governments are mandating the phasing out of gas powered cars. The EU has said that no gas powered cars are to be sold after 2035, and the UK is following suit. America is targeting a 50% EV market by 2030, and many other countries around the world are doing the same. And it's plain to see why electric cars are better for the planet than gas cars, right? Well, yes, but it's not quite so straightforward. A significant portion of harmful emissions that are made by a car don't happen when you drive it. It actually happens long before that, during the manufacturing process. A gas car will create roughly 9,000 kilograms of carbon emissions during its production. Driving the car around for a year only produces about 3,500 kilograms. EVs, on the other hand, produce about 10 to 11,000 kilograms of carbon during production, nearly 20% more than a gas-powered car. But driving an EV over the course of a year produces only 1,500 kilograms of carbon emissions. That's less than half of that of the gas car. Now, you're probably wondering though, I thought EVs were zero emissions. That's kind of true, I guess. EVs don't emit emissions out of a tailpipe like a gas car does, but that electricity has to come from somewhere. And for most places around the world, including the United States, a significant amount of electricity is produced with fossil fuels. So now you're probably wondering, what do all these numbers, kilograms of carbon, what does it all mean? Well, Engineering Explained has a great video on this, which I will link in the description below, but basically it means this. EVs are definitely better for carbon emissions than gas cars in the long run. But buying any new car in general, gas or EV, is going to be bad for the planet. For example, let's say you drive a gas powered car and it gets about 30 miles to the gallon, which is pretty average. If you trade that gas car in right now for an EV, you'll need to drive that electric car for over four years just to become carbon neutral. And then everything after that would be carbon positive. Now that seems pretty reasonable considering most Americans actually keep their car for about six to seven years before trading up to something new. But 
If you drive a Prius, for example, and get 50 miles to the gallon, you'll need to drive that new EV for over 11 years just to break even on the carbon emissions. And considering the rate of progress for electric vehicles, you'll have been left far behind in terms of electric motor and battery technology by the time you're even approaching becoming carbon neutral. And that's assuming you never have to replace the battery. But even with all of these caveats, electric cars are still the way forward. The energy grid will get greener, manufacturing will become more efficient, and economies of scale means that the more batteries we make, the cheaper and better for the planet they'll get over time. Right? Right? Okay, so yes, but also no. All these advancements in EV technology have been great steps forward, don't get me wrong. But I think there's one massive, glaring issue, not only with EVs, but also with the green initiative in general. When we talk about cars being green, we only ever talk about emissions or recycling, but there is far more impact than just that when it comes to making an electric car. Remember when we talked about the introduction of lithium ion batteries? And remember how I said they used all of those exotic materials? Well, those materials are mined like this. Wearing no shoes and in the most wretched conditions, Dorsan is ordered to retrieve the sack he's forgotten. The tunnels are dug by hand with no supports. They frequently collapse, especially during rain. For this, they'll get maybe eight British pence a day. What you're seeing right now is a cobalt mine in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The people that work on these mines are poor, often being paid less than a couple dollars a week. They are overworked, with many of them working 24 hour shifts or more. And many of them are children. Little kids that should be in school, growing and flourishing in their innocence. But instead, they're at the cobalt mine. Either orphans that are forced to work, or children of sick and poor families who rely on them to put food on the table. These mines have little in the way of protective equipment, non-existent safety guidelines, and little to no oversight. Children are often given drugs to suppress their hunger, so they can work 12-hour shifts without complaining. This is Ziki Swazi. He's 11 years old. His parents are dead and his grandmother is sick. So he works in the cobalt mine instead of going to school just so he can support his family. There have been numerous incidents of mines collapsing and crushing and killing dozens of people, many of whom are young teenagers because their small frames fit well into these narrow mine shafts and countless more workers have been injured or fallen ill because of working at the mines. Many of these mines sell directly to giant Chinese battery makers like Huayu and CDN, who go on to produce and sell batteries and cells to many major automakers around the planet. Congo produces about 50% of all the cobalt in the world. And in 2020, Volkswagen was the number one consumer of cobalt on the planet, having used nearly 3,000 tons of cobalt to make about 420,000 electric cars. Second on that list is none other than Tesla, who used just over 2,000 tons of cobalt to make about half a million electric cars. Companies like Hyundai, Daimler, and Stellantis follow close behind. And all of these companies plan to scale up their battery manufacturing effort by orders of magnitude over the next coming years. And those are just the car manufacturers. Every single mobile device we use today has a lithium ion battery. And companies like Apple and Samsung are sourcing cobalt at levels that rival the auto manufacturers. That means over the next 10 years, cobalt mining in the Congo will have to scale up dramatically to meet this massive demand. That means more and more of these destitute Congolese citizens will be forced into the mines. And it's not just cobalt. Congo is home to massive deposits of copper, manganese, and of course the all-important lithium, all of which are planning to be mined aggressively over the next coming years. After numerous probes by human rights organizations over the years, companies like Volkswagen, BMW, Apple, and Samsung have all stated that they are leading initiatives to create more humane mining in the Congo. But they're all just statements. Some cobalt mines have been given more oversight and cracked down on child labor, but the vast majority still seem totally unregulated, which has been proven with hidden video footage by news outlets and human rights organizations. It seems that so far, 
the only company to make an appreciable difference is Tesla, who developed a cobalt-free lithium iron phosphate battery for use in the Chinese market standard range Model 3. But that's just one model in the Chinese market, really just a drop in the bucket, considering the vast majority of their cars still use cobalt. So let me ask you a question. Having learned all of this, are EVs still green? Is the exploitation of poverty-stricken African laborers, children who have no other options, a fair trade-off for a greener future? I sure as hell don't think so. But let's be honest, I'm speaking from such a place of hypocrisy. I'm looking into a digital camera with a battery, reading from a laptop with a battery, with a smartphone in my pocket with a battery, all of which use cobalt that very well may have been mined from the Congo. The reality is this, technology will continue to forge the future. And that march of innovation has always and will always exploit whoever it needs to. The vast majority of people aren't going to stop buying phones or laptops or electric cars. But the very least we can do is acknowledge the fact that real exploitation goes into making our lives easier. And we can at least make sure that the manufacturers of all of these battery powered products that we use know that we are not okay with what they are doing. If you can, vote with your wallet. Don't buy a new phone or laptop and don't buy a new car, electric or otherwise, unless you really need to. And if that's not possible, then email Volkswagen or Chevy or Apple or tweet at Elon and tell them to make a change, something that's at a scale that really makes a difference. Donate to organizations that help Congolese children, like the Good Shepherd International Foundation or the Congo Children's Trust. These guys get children out of mines and back into school. And just don't let it be another thing that we brush off and forget. Because at the rate that electric cars are coming, it will only get far, far worse for the men, women, and children of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Thanks for watching guys. I'll have links for the charities and various sources below. I'll see you guys in the next one.